It's time for Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 248. Steve celebrates the 60th anniversary of the laser with a story from his own childhood about a portable dog killer and uh, the unintended consequences. It's really an inspiring story for anybody who uh, wants to get involved in creating new things. Security Now is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for Security Now is provided by AOL Music and Spinner.com, where you can get free MP3s, exclusive interviews, and more. Video bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y.com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 248 for May 13th, 2010. The Portable Dog Killer. Security Now is brought to you by. Go to Assist Express. If you're tired of traveling to fix tech support problems in person, resolve them quickly online with Go to Assist Express. For a free 30-day trial, go to gotoassist.com slash security. And by Astaro Corporation, makers of the Astaro Security Gateway. Visit astaro.com or call 877 the number 4 Astaro to schedule a free trial of the Astaro Security Gateway in your business. And by the new Carbonite Pro. It's simple, secure, and affordable online backup for your small business. For a free trial and to learn more, visit carbonitepro.com. It's time for Security Now, the show that covers everything you need to know about keeping yourself safe, secure, and private online. Who better to do that than the man who discovered spyware, coined the term, wrote the first anti-spyware program. He's been a security maven for years. The author of SpinRight, the world's best hard drive utility, Mr. Steve Gibson of GRC.com. Steve, hey, good, Leo. good to see you. Great to be with you again, as always. We have today a very different episode. Um, one that I really do believe our listeners are going to get a big kick out of, something I've never done before. Uh, a number of, there's sort of a confluence of things that came together. This is actually this coming Sunday, May 16th, is the 50th anniversary of the invention of the laser. Whoa! Um, first cool. time that uh, it was done practically. Uh, Einstein uh, gave us the the fundamental theory back in 1917 which which predicted that you could sti you you could stimulate the emission of radiation which is what the ser of laser stands for that you could stimulate the emission of radiation from from molecules um but it wasn't until many years later and may 16th 1960 was the day that some some researchers at Hughes first made a laser laze. There was a maser beforehand, a microwave amplification through stimulated emission of radiation, but never super high frequency, which is to say light amplification through stimulated emission of radiation. Anyway, the show is not about lasers. This is about something I did when I was 16 years old. Oh. Um, uh, that was sort of related mm -hmm. uh the episode is called this episode is called the portable dog killer <laughs> <laughs> oh god i can't wait <laughs> which i'm going to explain of course but the anniversary of the laser got me thinking about this also the, the, i've been uh, you know now uh, twitter plus one week how's that been for you uh, well, well, we'll talk about that in errata a little bit. Good. Uh, it's been really interesting, but but mostly there was just a, a really tremendous outpouring of people. I'm approaching 5,000 yeah, followers. I love and, it. And you're posting great stuff. You took my advice to heart. You're posting a lot of great links, and it's wonderful. It's been, well, and I've been getting a lot of great feedback about it. And so that kind of warmed me up. And I thought, well, let's try something different, a personal episode, but also one of the other things that that we've sort of talked about a couple times is something I'm constantly getting from people in the Q&A uh, mailbag is questions about career. Like, how do I do, how do I get going? How do I compete? How do I 
you know, get traction in the world. And so this story I'm going to tell has a moral also that sort of, I think, vividly answers that question. So we're going to have some fun in this next hour or so. Well, we always love uh, hearing stories from Steve. So this is good. We do have security news. We have uh, yep. uh, some updates, too. And I, I want to hear your Twitter experiences. Before we do that, can I just inter interpose? Now's the time. A word from our friends at Citrix. They do the great uh, go to meeting. Go to my PC for years. We've used. I started using it on the screensavers. A program called Go to Assist. Now they've they've caught, they call it Go to Assist Express to underscore that it's fresh, it's new, it's fast, really fast, and it's designed for the tech support professional. If you're tired of trying to, you know, fix a support problem in person or worse over the phone, oh, I just hate that. You know, click start. Okay, go to the accessories. I just hate that. I can't do it. Go, you're gonna, you, you know what your impulse is. I let me just let me, let me get out of the way. Let me fix it. But if they're across the country or even just down the hall, maybe you can't. That's where Go to Assist makes it so so cool. Go to assist.com slash security. You can try it free for thirty days, so you can find out exactly what I'm talking about. It will let you increase revenue by handling more support requests. You could do up to eight at the same time. Why would you want to do well? What if you've got an install going on one, a scan going on another? time-consuming stuff that you don't want to sit there and watch the clock go. So you just go to the next session and the next session and the next session. You can do unattended support, which is really nice. And, you know, that, that means you don't have to wait till your client is sitting at the computer to do it. It's very easy for your client. They don't have to have anything installed. You could send them a link via email. You can be in a chat with them. Oh, and by the way, it has integrated chat, so you could say what you're doing if they are sitting there wa watching. You get uh, an assay that tells you what operating system, what security software, whatever software is running in the background. It works on PCs and Macs. They do have a day pass. I, you know, I always say it's for the pro, but they do for somebody who just says, oh, you know, I got Aunt Matilda, Mom, Grandpa, uh, Little Joey. I got to fix a bunch of computers. I, you could get a day pass and just get it all done at once. Or, better yet, 30 days free right now. Go to assist.com. G-O-T-O assist.com slash security. Not security now, but just security. And you can set it up, try it free for 30 days. Of course, because it's from Citrix, they've got state-of-the-art security SSL behind it. All the data is completely secure. Uh, free, free customer service 24-7. Not that you're going to need it. It's one of those things that just works. I just love what they do. It just works. Give it a try. Go to assist.com slash security. We thank them for their support of security now. So shall we start with uh, news? Yeah, we have our typical <laughs> our typical lineup okay. of calamities and disasters. Uh, this is um, just, the, this is our first podcast after the second Tuesday of the month. So of course, we've got Microsoft's monthly security update. This one was very skinny. Although broad, um, they only released two patches this Tuesday on the May 11th, um, but they affected pretty much everything. Mm. Um, they're critically rated. Um, they affect every version of the operating system, which Microsoft still supports, probably the ones that Microsoft doesn't support any longer, too. And in fact, they remind us again that Windows 2000 support ends in July. So Windows 2000, XP, 2003, Vista, 2008, Windows 7, uh, and even 2008 R2, um, Office XP had some effect, both XP 2003 and 2007. So all the OSs and the Office suite. Um, they had a problem. There was a, a, a DLL overrun problem, a memory corruption vulnerability in the stack. And of course, thanks to our, our series on fundamental computer technology. Our listeners have a much better sense for what a stack is today. Um, and then also an embarrassing DNS spoofing problem where, you know, we've talked about DNS spoofing almost about a year ago um, when Kaminsky uh, exposed what was going on with um, servers not right. being sufficiently random in their queries. Well, it turns out that Microsoft hasn't been that in some cases they were using sequential DNS IDs, <laughs> which is as bad as it gets. And in another case, they were ignoring the co a comparison check for the returned ID so that, so that it was possible to spoof 
these operating systems with fake DNS replies. So it's like, whoops, um, that's fixed as of a couple days ago. So it's not a big, horrible problem, but it's something that you're definitely going to want to update, as I'm sure everyone will. And it's, it doesn't matter which version of Windows you're using. Wow. Um, so uh, following up on, remember we, talk, we uh, talked about months ago now, the school in Pennsylvania, the Lower Marion oh, School District. Yeah. Well, it turns out that uh, as these things go, much more research has been done. And what brought this back on my radar was just the number of pictures that had been taken of students in their homes by the IT people. 58,000. What? 58,000 <laughs> so, pictures. Obviously, they were on and constantly shooting. Uh, but yes, exactly. Oh, this, is, this is criminal. Somebody's going to jail. Well, That's and appalling. So, so they, they've, of course, been sued by the outraged parents of students. That's appalling. And in a report that they commissioned, that is, that, that, that their defense, the, the school district's defense law firm commissioned, uh, that they hired to defend them against this, the, the report said, quote, the district's failure to implement policies, procedures, and record-keeping requirements, and the overzealous and questionable use of technology by IS personnel without any apparent regard for privacy considerations or sufficient consultation with administrators is, you know, lies at, 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 at the root of this problem. Wow. It's like, uh, okay, well, Shocking. yeah, not, not good. But when I saw 58,000, I thought, okay, we got to, I just have to mention that again because that's, uh, Amazing. There was a power just... trip going on, too. I, I remember reading some comments from one of the IT people like, oh, yes. It's, she said something like they were talking about watching these vid these uh, oh. pictures. And she says, yeah, it's addicting, isn't it? It's like, what? Wow. It's like, well, voyeurism. She was, it was voyeuristic. It was creepy. Yeah. It was really creepy. Wow. Um, I wanted to advise our listeners that there is a, a, an old worm which has reappeared in new clothing. Um, it's using Yahoo Messenger and is in the process of accelerating its spread around the world. Um, it's becoming a big problem. And so a number of security firms have are alerting people. Um, Bitdefender has and Symantec has. Um, it uses Yahoo Messenger. Um, so it spreads through IMing people who are, you know, who your friends are in, in Yahoo Instant Messenger. Um, it appears as a JPEG or a GIF image, which is actually malicious code. Um, and it's an aggressive Trojan. It installs a backdoor in the victim's machine, which allow attackers to take over the machine to install additional malware, steal files, intercept passwords, and grab other authentication information, launch spam, or other malware attacks against other systems, and much like Conficker, although this is not Conficker, it's picked up Conficker's additional spreading tricks, so it spreads not only through IM, but also via network shares on the machine that's been infected, removable USB drives using auto run. So, you know, this is something you absolutely don't want to get. So, unfortunately, it comes from it, it comes in the disguise of messages from people you know and trust. Oh, it's not from a stranger. No, it's not Ooh. from a stranger. They have so, to be infected themselves, of course. Yes, and so it is it is jumping around a lot. So just wanted to give everyone a heads up. There is a, um, a new zero-day exploit for Safari on Windows. I thought this was kind of funny because it wasn't. Now, they say they don't know if it's Safari on the Mac. Yeah, uh, well, exactly, and... I don't know that it's affected anybody because right. who's running Safari on Windows? Well, some people, apparently. Uh, <laughs> okay. Anyway, Windows Safari version 4.0.5 and earlier is vulnerable. It has not been seen in the wild. It was disclosed by a security firm that said, oh, by the way, here's a way that you can abuse the way Safari handles pop-ups and uh, in fact, it was uh, Secunia that, that we've talked about right. before. They're that's good. A, a, a good company. Yep. Um, they produced a demo where you're, they're able to launch just the Windows calculator app, which demonstrates that they're able to run arbitrary code on your machine. Hmm. So 
I'm sure, you know, Apple will fix this quickly, I would imagine. And though there will Maybe. be an update, which we'll <laughs> probably talk about next week or, yeah. or soon, I hope. Yeah. That would be good. And there's been a lot of controversy about a supposed massive new um, problem that affects all antivirus software. It's, uh, th there, there's a technique um, or a, a, actually a component of Windows called the System Service Descriptor Table, the SSDT. And this has been making the rounds in the last few days, but um, Patrick Norton picked up on the fact or somehow someone said to him, and, and then he actually tweeted it. I've, I learned about it through his... See, his Twitter? See, tw see. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, um, that, in fact, this is old news from as far in the past as 2002. So I didn't have a chance to, to pursue this this week, but I wanted to let everyone know who's listening that I'm, I'm aware of this because um, I've been getting, you know, responses from through Twitter, and I'm sure there's there's mail in the mail bag about this. So I will have a, a an informed response next week to you know nail down whether this is actually news. Uh, what what Patrick is saying is th through what he found is that someone is claiming and is showing links to this being old news that has essentially been plagiarized some security firm saying that this is their invention when in fact they're just taking something that was known years ago. So I don't know one way or the other, but it's, uh, it's something worth pursuing. Yeah, and of course, uh, we talked about this, or maybe we talked about it on Windows Weekly, but 64-bit uh, Windows has this kernel protection, which kind of prevents soft, uh, antivirus companies from using this suspect technique anyway. Yes, in fact, well, one of the... It, it's been a problem that that Windows historically has has required, a, I'll, I guess I say, aggressive techniques to to do things other than run apps. When you know, and we're going to be talking uh, actually next week about operating systems, and okay. you know, in our in, in our continuing uh, look at fundamental technology. But what operating systems sort of do by definition is publish a bunch of services, the so-called API of the operating system that client programs, that is programs running under the operating system, use in order to do what they want to do. Well, the problem with anti any kind of antivirus program is it doesn't want to run as a client. I mean, it doesn't want to be like a, a an equal citizen on the operating system because it can't in order to do the kinds of things it wants to do. If it's going to be intercepting your email, if it's going to be somehow hooking into your network and checking for, you know, spam regardless of what clients you're using or, or checking pages before they come up in your browser, it's, it has to function very much like an addition to the operating system. It's got to get underneath and not just be, a, a, you know, operating as as a typical OS client. Well, Microsoft has never provided what we would call hooks for that. I mean, that's really it's sort of antithetical to what they want. They don't want people messing with the core of the operating system. And you can understand because if that's it's it's extremely dangerous to do that. That's where blue screens come from. Traditionally, as you know, Leo, you know, bad drivers, video drivers right. or network drivers were the source of all these blue screens. Well, because you, you know, need ring zero access to really blue screen a, correct, a Windows machine. Correct. The modern. And, but that's, that is the operating system. Right. And so AV systems that install their own drivers, they're operating at ring zero. They're down there. And unless the developers are extremely careful, this can destabilize the operating system, where it's not just the app that crashes, but it takes the whole system down. You know, somewhere there has to be this ultimate authority in the computer, and that's the OS. So, so traditionally in 32-bit world, it was possible to go in and hook these system calls using this, for example, this system service descriptor table or... I talked about the other day my own memory management auditing, which was causing those problems when 
um, uh, when we came to the attention of of um, the New York Times um, and oh yeah, <laughs> the uh, server went kapoey. We really had a problem, right? Yeah. Well, and the reason was I was hooking all of my own use of global memory allocation. So you know, doing something really not playing by the rules, but if you do it right, it's safe and and can be you know no one's doubting that it's useful. The problem is that you know there's this tension between my, what Microsoft wants and what developers want. Well, Microsoft ended the tension once and for all with 64 bits by just simply disallowing this behavior. They actually could technically disallow it in the 32-bit OSs, but that would break like all these things that are part of the ecosystem in Windows. And Microsoft, you know, much as they may wish they could, they just can't come back and do that retroactively. Right. So they, they, they've said, okay, from the beginning, we're never going to allow this, but we are going to compensate by providing some, some alternative means, that is, publishing a way for these, you know, applications written for 64-bit windows to gain permission to insert themselves into the way that they need to, to be a firewall, to be an antivirus, and so forth. So, so that's, that's the, the story there. Yeah. And, and, and let's hope that the going forward, these things just don't come up anymore. I, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you laughed. Uh -huh. <laughs> Explosive laughter. <laughs> uh, what else? So we have some errata, but you wanted to... Before we get to the errata, yes, I do want to make a little mention of one of our sponsors, if you don't mind. And, uh, of course, coming up, Steve's going to tell a shaggy dog tale that involves a laser and his youth, his misspent youth. But uh, before, what you do not want to do right now is misspend your backup dollar. And that's why I'm going to tell everybody to go to CarbonitePro.com right now. You've heard me talk about Carbonite, the consumer version. Uh, it's got all the features you know you look for in backup. It's automatic, so you don't have to think about it. Constantly using your high-speed connection to the Internet to trickle your updated, modified data up to its servers in the sky. Supports the best encryption there is, AES 256-bit encryption. You control the key. No one else does, so it's totally private. Uses SSL even if you're using AES 256-bit, the old belt and suspenders routine. And you can get your files from Carbonite anytime. Any computer you can get online with, there even is an iPhone app, so you can see what's up there. You can get, you know, it's it's really a great solution for off-site backup. So good that a lot of businesses started using the consumer version of Carbonite. Several hundred thousand. <laughs> and the folks at Carbonite, I talked to David Friend, he said, when we found this out, we said, hmm, maybe there's a need for a enterprise version. And that's when they came up with Carbonite Pro. Simple, secure, affordable online backup for your small business. And it is so slick. You can try it free for 30 days right now. In fact, I don't think I needed a credit card. I think I just went to CarbonitePro.com and boom, I'm using it. As many seats as you have, each, uh, you know, you can, there's a centralized dashboard so you can see how each computer is backing up, whether it's backed up. You can allow employees to access their own backups so they can do the restore without bugging you. Of course, you can be notified of what's going on. Uh, the beauty of this is, look, Data loss happens. You know that. Whether a hard drive fails or something worse, flood. We've seen these floods in Nashville. Um, you know, uh, when your office is flooded or there's a fire, you lose the backups unless you have off-site. That's why you've got to have an off-site solution like Carbonite. You can be back up and running within minutes. Prices start at $10 a month for your entire business. I'll give you an example. $25 a month with if you have eight computers, five gigabytes of uh, backup total. 25 bucks a month, very affordable, very easy. You don't have to be an IT wizard to set this up, but even IT departments all over the country are starting to use Carbonite Pro. CarbonitePro.com. Try it free right now for 30 days. It's a great solution. I use Carbonite myself. In fact, my daughter's about to uh, go to college. She, of course, is going to get a laptop to go with her. I'm not even going to mention it, but I'm putting Carbonite on that laptop because I don't want to get a call in the middle of the night, and I know I will if I don't, Daddy, I lost my computer and all my papers were on there. Or the hard drive died, Daddy. What do I do? No, I just say, don't worry about it. I got it. We got it covered. CarbonitePro.com. Try it free right now. All right. Uh, so, errata. Errata. 
Um, I absolutely wanted to chime in on Paul Thurot's... Oh, the co copy and paste thing. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure there is something broken. Oh, this is great. I, I mean, it's been driving me crazy, and Paul, uh, too, because we just thought it was us. Yeah, I know, and that was me, too. In fact, it's gotten so bad for me that I'm sometimes right-clicking on the blob that I select and then so, and choosing copy because Control-C just doesn't seem to grab it all the time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and I'm sure the app has focus. We, we, we should back up a little bit for people who yeah, aren't aware. Yeah, let's explain it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I was listening to you and Paul do Windows Weekly last Thursday, and Paul said, you know, he's sort of scratching his head. He said, you know, um, I'm, it, it's occurred to me that maybe there's actually a bug that no one has ever detected before, right. which who knows when it came along, but it's like Windows is not reliably responding to Control C for copying whatever is currently marked into the Windows clipboard. And when he said that, I mean, when I heard him say that, I thought, yeah, I mean, this is, it's been something that's been really annoying for some length of time. And I don't know when they broke it or how they broke it or, but it, I mean, it's not, it doesn't, it do, doesn't always not work, but it definitely, it, you know, and, and as, as you said, Leo, it's so easy for the whole Windows community to think, well, maybe I just, it's us. Well, I didn't press the wrong button, or yeah. it didn't have focus, or I didn't press it hard enough. Or I mean, who knows? Right. But you know, as enough people are beginning to say, "Yes, I'm," that's happening to me too. There's this growing momentum behind this idea that there's some subtle bug in good old Windows copy and paste that isn't, at least in the copy side, that isn't copying. I, I'm some. In fact, sometimes I'll like I'll be pasting what I had on the clipboard before because it didn't get replaced by the control C. So it seems that pasting is reliable, but copying often isn't. And who knows why? Well, you know, he, you probably heard him say that Microsoft's sending somebody out. <laughs> they they want to they observe and see. They're trying to figure it out. They're not saying there's a bug, but they, they want to find out if there is one. And uh, enough people report it. Now, I, during the show, I said, yeah, I, it, I've had it happen to me. And I thought I hadn't, but I use Macs most of the time. It hadn't happened to me in Macs. And so I've been paying attention and it has happened to me on Macs as well. Occasionally on a Macintosh, you will select text, do a con command C, which is mm -hmm. the copy command on the Mac. And the Mac highlights briefly the edit menu when you do that to say, yeah, I got a command C. So you know that the command C mm -hmm. has been issued. Nice. And you'll go to another field, and there's nothing there. You'll paste, and there's nothing there. So my sense is, and I don't know how the Windows pasteboard works. I know how the Macs does because I used to write more software for the Mac. Um, and it stores uh, uh, data on the, on the pasteboard in, f with formatting, and sometimes in a variety of ways, depending on the application, what mm -hmm. the application is saying. So the application may say, well, I want you to save this as text, RTF, whatever. Uh, the receiving application would have to understand that formatting. And I, my sense is that sometimes there's um, an impedance mismatch between the data that was copied and what can be pasted in the in the target program. And so on the Mac, I think that's what's happening. But I don't know what's happening on Windows or if it's related. I yeah, imagine I, the, I, the mechanism's the same. Yes, it's a very similar mechanism. And you are able, for example, you're, you're, you're able to to copy rich text, for example, right. that's got like much more embellishments on the text into the Windows clipboard. And then if you paste that into an app which is not rich text aware, that is the app only knows plain text, then you just, it strips the rich, te rich text out and only does plain text. Is that so an OS see, feature or? Um, yeah, it, it, well, it, it's a feature of the app saying, the, the, this is what I'm able to accept. Right. And then the then Windows looks at what's on the clipboard and gives it, you know, like, like the best of what it's able to accept. Right, right, right. So, but it, it, it could be something like you're, you're positing Some also. Some sort of mismatch, yeah. Yeah. Well, we um, don't know. I think I'm glad, though, that you've observed it. I have as well. And maybe, Something's wrong. You know, yeah. my motto on Call for Help was always, it's not your fault. Because we assume, I think it's natural, oh, I'm doing something wrong. And it often isn't. <laughs> Yes. Well, and with something so fundamental, I yeah. mean, and I, I mean, if we, if we didn't have the clipboard, I'm using it constantly oh, on yeah. the iPad. I'm using it constantly in Windows. I mean, it's just so handy for moving things around. And it's just, you know, wow, for the idea that it's something wrong with that. It's like, okay, that's, 
that's who knows when it kind of crept in, but it seems to be happening. Um, speaking of my iPad, I did have it hang actually many times, but once at a perfect opportunity for me to go back to the Good. Apple store. Good. So I showed it to them. They'd never seen one like this before. They, I mean, they, they, it, it, I watched it escalate to several through several tiers of quote geniuses at the Apple <laughs> store. They got smarter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, you know, it, it kept elevating it up to someone. And I heard them mumbling, "Oh, it could be a memory problem." <laughs> and uh, and I and and you know, the guy immediately wanted to do like the master hard reset. I said, "Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. That will fix it." <laughs> and it's going to be fine after you do that for a while. So, you know, you're not going to be able to make it happen again. I want you to see right now, acknowledge that it's not behaving correctly. Right. You know, that it's not responding. I said, this happens typically several times a day. And, you know, I'm, I'm okay with fixing it. But for a while, I thought it was software. But a good friend of mine, Leo Laporte, says, no, 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 that should never happen. And he's like, you know, Leo Laporte. I say, yeah, but that's a long story. So, <laughs> did really did that help? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe you know. But a lot of people know you, Leo. So yeah, I guess so. Wow. Uh, and and a lot of people want to say that you're their that, that you're their friend. So yeah. Um, so uh, I recommend that, by the way, when you go to the Apple Store, always <laughs> say you know Leo. Yeah. I could have pulled Waz out, but I thought that's no, even better. Go. Probably don't need was, and he would maybe not believe me more. So, <laughs> right. Anyway, so I got this thing got escalated. the The problem is that then he goes away to try to find a replacement. We've decided we're going to replace it, and he came back out rather sheepishly and said, "Okay, we're going to give you a, an exchange." And the problem is, we don't have any. Oh yeah, that's right. We we don't even have a hidden secret. That's you know, right. like reserve pile anywhere. Believe me, there just aren't any. And he said, but we, we, we've written it up and, you know, we're going to cue you in for an exchange. And it says, as you know, as soon as we get one in the store, you're up. And so we'll send you email. The Apple store will send you email saying that your new 3G iPad is here. Come get it. And so I said, that's, that's fine. That's all I want. I said, it's not such a horrible problem that it's keeping me from, you know, using the machine. It only happens, you know, very, very sporadically, but definitely repeats. And I've seen so, enough iPads now, you know, we've gone through, you know, we have several in house and I've set up a couple and I've never seen anything like that. So I think that absolutely that there, there is something going on there. Yeah. It generally happens when I'm enabling and disabling networking, when I'm like switching between... Ah. LAN and 3G, turning those on and off. I, I often hang in the control panel right as I like power up or power down the 3G. And I mean, so that may, I may be doing that more often than most people who just sort of leave 3G on for, you know, like leave everything on. I'm big on power conservation. So I'm turning everything off that I'm not using. So yeah, see, I never uh, touch any of that stuff. Yeah. So maybe, well, anyway, I'm happy to have a new one. And, uh, and if this does, if it hangs in the same way, then I'll say, okay, it's, you know, it's a bug associated with your behavior. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> it's definitely a bug. I mean, it shouldn't. Nobody. You know, nobody should. That should not happen. Um, I did tweet an interesting article that I ran across by our well-known UI guru Jacob Nielsen. Oh yeah. You know Jacob Nielsen, of Absolutely. course. Absolutely. He's been on Net at Night, and I've interviewed him many times. Great guy. Yeah. Great guy. He's had a very interesting and rather critical um, first look at the iPad UI that is sort of the 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 problems with it you know the fact that a lot of things are non discoverable the the i i did i did tweet that that if that's the word uh, that's the word and the and the short link is i'm using bitly so bit.ly slash and then lowercase bbnz3 uppercase M. And so that will take you to this report. And then he, there, there's a summary there, but also a 97 page detailed PDF with his more detailed findings. And there's enough there that I, I would urge any iPad developers who are listening to, to read that 97 page detailed report. He, he really brings up a lot of good points about, you know, the the lack of discoverability. Oh, of I so agree. I so agree. 
Yeah, I've I've struggled sometimes like to delete something. Now I get that that horizontal wipe thing. And and Leo, I wanted to say the I am so glad you mentioned swiping up from the exclamation point to get an apostrophe. Isn't that a huge help? Yes. Oh, well, and so I wanted to ask you, are there any more like that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, great. And how, where are they? They're are not they documented. Written? I'm sure they're oh. somewhere. But the keyboard, well, for instance, uh, another handy one. So the, the point of that one is that the, f the, the main keyboard doesn't have an apostrophe on it, which right. is something you use all the time. Yeah, I'm big on contractions. Yeah, and, but and, you know, and, you'll and, find and, if, you type, if you type if you type D O N T that the the automatic yes. correction will put an apostrophe in. Yes. Where it really hurts is it's and it's. Yes. Because it you know it doesn't always it, do the right thing. Both are legal. Yeah. So there are a few times where it doesn't put the apostrophe in, and I think I can't remember what they are, but uh, you you need an apostrophe, and you don't want to have to hit two keys to get an apostrophe. So if you press your finger on the exclamation mark. And drag it up. The apostrophe is hiding there, oh. and there it is. Now you can. There's a handy one with a with a period. Oh, uh, the, the the double tap. Double space tap is bar. one, and then the other one is that um, if if you want a period, a quick period, and you so you go to the you know uh, punctuation menu, and you drag the period up, it will then go back to the alphabetic menu. So it's a quick way to get out of the punctuation menu with a period. Oh, nice. Not having to manually switch back. I'd love to know more. You know, this is why, by the way, we're going to do an iPad show. And I did tell you about dragging the shift key onto a letter? No. Oh, that's how you can get a quick capitalization. Oh, onto a word, you mean? No, on, on if, for example, if you wanted capital, if you wanted, if you wanted capital A, yeah. rather than tapping the capital, then tapping the A, you can just drag the, that, the, the shift key button over to the a and let go of it oh look at that ha <laughs> <laughs> that'll save me time typing twit <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and then yeah so that's great and then uh, the period one is so you want to put a period in you hit the period one two three uh what was it oh now i've forgotten this and is these come period. from the iPo iphone oh okay yeah i mean that's i think that, that look there's some UI stuff that Apple's assuming everybody knows from the iPhone. There's some stuff that's just not discoverable. And we talked about the other day sitting in pages in portrait uh, landscape mode and saying, where's the controls? Yeah. And until you go into portrait mode, you know, you tilt it, you don't get any controls. And Jacob actually makes that point. He says it's a real problem that the UI is different depending upon orientation. It's hidden. You know? Yeah. And the other thing I'm thinking is that some things were clearly done cleverly, I thought, for the iPhone form factor, for the iPhone screen size. For example, the fact yes. that the scroll, the scroll bar appears transiently only when you're actually scrolling and then fades out. Well, that's nice because you don't want it taking up space. But now that you've got, you know, 1024 pixels horizontally when, when you're in landscape, you know, I, I'm finding, I, as I'm like looking at a PDF... I'd like to be able to look at the scroll thumb to get a sense for where I am in the document. No, and order, there's no feedback. Yeah, and there's no feedback. You got to, you know, you got to start a scroll in order to force that 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 scroll bar back on. So there are some things that are, you know, they they scaled up and they kept some of the cute things that arguably they they in, they innovated for the iPhone, which eh, you know I'd rather have like an option to have that scroll that scroll image stay there instead of fade out. So anyway, uh, he really makes, in my opinion, he nailed a whole bunch of things. So I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging um, any developers to read that because, I mean, it's funny too, because here's Apple who's, who, who port portends to be all about like the, you know, the fantastic UI and the experience and, you know, all of that. And they have draconian control over what apps make it onto the iTunes store, or actually which apps make it anywhere onto their iPhone or iPad. Yet they're not enforcing any of this. And developers do have an awful lot of freedom to just make stuff up. And we're sitting here scratching our head. It's like, okay, you know, you know, trying to trying to figure out, you know, wrestling with the user interface. And some people in response to my tweet said, well, yeah, this is how you innovate. This is, you know, instead of being locked into a rigid UI, 
new ideas are going to come up. And I and I and my response is, well, okay, the reason the telephone succeeds is that when you're on the phone, you're not fighting with the phone. You're talking to the person. You know, the user interface disappears into the background. And and too often, you're actually, I mean, pretty as it is, you're, you're seeing the UI and you're arguing with it, trying to get what you want, rather than it just really being there to facilitate your, your work. So I think he made some great points. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a little frustrating. And it, it's true that Apple, you know, when they first started out with the Macintosh, had very strict user guidelines. And one of the reasons it was easy to use is every application adhered to them. And uh, they've, they've, they've definitely wandered. Yeah. <laughs> from, well, and the, as the applications become more uh, um, advanced and as the screen gets bigger now, there's just more room to, to do wacky things. They, need to, they, they really need to get back to uh, some sort of user interface guidelines. That would be a good thing. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they publish them, but they don't, I think they don't uh, enforce They them. clearly don't yeah. enforce them. Yeah. Well, and, and they're, they're, you know, it, it, it's they who invented all these wacky keyboard shortcuts <laughs> yeah. we were just talking yeah. about. So it's yeah. not like they're, they're, they've got a clean bill of health themselves no. either. I'm with you. I'm with so, you. So um, a week into... Um, Twitter. The I have Twitter a few, experiment. Few um, I've been, you know, I've got about, I'm, I'm approaching 5,000 followers, which is neat. Now, you should, we should say, you have two accounts. I have two accounts, yes. I have just Gibson Research, spelled all the way out like that, Gibson Research, and then, which is sort of for corporate, you know, no, I won't be talking about Naval Lint as I described it last week. <laughs> Actually, I haven't talked about anything there. I bet I'm you haven't talked about Naval Lint even on the other one. <laughs> I'm <laughs> no. guessing. But I, no, I, I, actually, a number of users have written back and said, now, is that a Naval Lint posting? <laughs> uh, so um, m my personal account is Agile Synapse, A-G-I-L-E-S-Y-N-A-P-S-E. -E. Um, and... Anyway, it's it's been an interesting experience for me. I'm I've developed I'm, I'm I'm developing an appreciation for what I would call the haiku of 140 characters, because sometimes you really do need to struggle to fit something into that space. One of my favorite tweets, shortly after I began, uh, read, "When I'm out walking in the morning after breakfast, I see many dogs out walking their people." <laughs> and I think that's so good for those people. <laughs> that's naval so, lint. <laughs> so that's, uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, but Leo, how is it you're following eighteen thousand people? That's a little bit of a mistake, and I'm thank thankfully it's gone back down to uh, fourteen hundred, which I think is still too many. Wait, but that's under your control. No. You know about the follow bug, right? That happened dur to you during the follow bug. Oh yeah. Oh, my goodness. I thought that was deliberate. Oh, no, I don't want to follow all those people. Okay. Oh, I see. Only 1,400. It's Well, in my opinion, <laughs> the right number is somewhere in the 100 to 200 range. Really? You only follow two. We got to get you... Uh, but that's all no, right. I, you know, you with Twitter, there's a learning curve, and you're doing really well, Steve. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> and we don't we take baby steps. But okay. uh, the next step is, because you're putting great stuff in there, if you follow good people like Agile Synapse, you get the same kind of high quality feedback and it can be very valuable. You already said you, you learned something from Twitter and that's from yep. following two people. Yep. So um, I think if you choose, you got to choose carefully. What I, what I find is I follow readily, but I unfollow even more readily. Okay. So you, 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 you see a good post from somebody, follow it. And if they, and then if it's, it's junk after that, you just unfollow them. It's, yeah. it's okay to follow and unfollow. Now, and so it sort of finds its own level. The bug was that forced follow bug, which I'm sure you saw in the news. Yes. In fact, I have that here in my notes. And yeah. it was, it was funny too, because someone s s sent me a tweet and said, okay, four days after you join, there's a major Twitter security problem. Hmm. And it's like, oh, well, that's. <laughs> hmm. You're following two good people, by the way, Patrick and Paul. Excellent. Yeah. Just you want more like that, and you follow people of like mind. So what happened was, as you know, the bug was that, and I suspect this was in Twitter from day one, and just somebody finally found. I think it. well, it was you know a actually it it they discovered it inadvertently because they it was somebody who posted um, follow P W O or P W O N. Um, it was accept is the is the key accept, word. Accept accept was the word. And right. Pones was what he what he said. Yes, and what he realized was he, when he saw that, he discovered that that person was Pones now was following, following him. 
And so it, 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 it actually flows, it was a command, it, it flowed from the original um, text command exactly. language, yeah. which, which in this case didn't require a pending follow request in order to accept it. That's the it, error. Yes, exactly. So you could force Bill Gates or Oprah or Ashton Kutcher to follow you just by saying accept at Oprah and right. all of a sudden Oprah's following you and anything you tweet, Oprah's seeing. Exactly. So it was a way to, to get those eyeballs. So I don't follow 18,000 people. I think you, oh, okay. you, know, you can't effectively follow that many. So, uh, so that, means bug, that, uh, that means that roughly 18,000 people force followed me. I was just going to say, during the, the window uh, that this was known, right. it, the, all those people, you know... Said, follow at Leo Laporte, or <laughs> accept at Leo Laporte. Accept at Leo Laporte. How funny. Wow. Then, okay, then, so Twitter, so then, then Twitter zeroed it out. So for a while, we all had nobody. And that's what I saw. Because, you know, I was refreshing from time to time, watching my, my follower count going up. And then it went to zero. Right. My first thought was, oh, my God, I've been <laughs> hacked. You know, somebody, you know, gotten in. But, you know, I can't even enter my own password. So I don't know how anybody else could. And so it's like, okay, well, maybe not. And then, then you know, quickly the, the news came up the, of, about what was going on. So Right, right. And... And how important do you think it is to have a shorter handle? I mean, I'm now understanding that, for example, it would be nice, it would be convenient for people if Agile Synapse wasn't so long because sometimes you're wanting to put multiple mentions in a single tweet right. and, and so forth. Yeah, I think that's good. It's hard to get a short handle now that, you know, hundreds of millions of people yes. have used it. Uh, I also think it's good to use your own name in, in, in your case. Um, this is, we were talking before the show about something called SEO, the ability to find the stuff you're looking for on the internet. And that's why I use at Leo Laporte because people can find that. Uh, in right. order to find Agile Synapse, because frankly, Twitter's uh, search for search for people's uh, uh, feature isn't very good. Oh, they, and if you put Steve Gibson in, there's already, right. you know, thousands of Steve Gibson. Yeah, it's so, too late for you to get Steve Gibson. So yeah. I think Agile Synapse is fine. I would stay with it. It's hard to find a short one. Um, it's also somebody saying in the chat room, it would be nice to have something people know how to spell. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. homonyms are confusing. So, well, you know, for example, I also grabbed SG is me. That's which good. Is really short. Just a lot of people uh, will do the real Steve Gibson or the Steve Gibson. Yeah, but, but then we're, we're kind of long again. So. Yeah. I don't think length is that big a deal. Most people use automated. Uh, uh, very few people use the web interface of Twitter. Most people right. use third-party tools that do a lot of this for them. So I wouldn't right. worry too much. They can cut and paste. Okay. Well, I'm having Copy a good and time. Paste. And what I think I'm probably going to do, are you sitting down? Uh-oh. Another one? Well. Just don't join Facebook. No, no. I'm thinking that probably what I need to do, because I am, I am having a problem with 140 characters. There are some times where I'd really like to explain a concept in some depth, like... Buzz, you know, baby. Huh? Buzz. Google Buzz. What about a blog? Oh, my God. No, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you did a blog, I would be thrilled. And that's exactly, you know, they call Twitter microblogging. But right. you're exact, and a lot of bloggers found that they blogged less because they were able to post short bursts on Twitter, and that kind of satisfied their urge. But I think it's interesting. You're getting the opposite urge, which I, I wholeheartedly endorse. We would love a, a Steve Gibson blog. I'm, I'm, I'm running across that. For example, I've, I've tried to say some things in 140 characters, which were misunderstood because that's right. I just couldn't be expressive enough. Right. And so then I'm getting people who are saying, you know, responding. You know, in a way that I wish I could have clarified, and I would have right. clearly had I more space. And so maybe the thing to do is to do a blog posting and then Twitter the presence of the blog posting. That's ex that's what that's exactly kind of what what people do because and, you're already doing that. You're putting links to Jacob Nielsen's blog right. post, right? So well, and now and that brings up another problem because I'm you know me you can't I mean I won't click on anybody else's shortcuts. I so. Agree. Why is anybody clicking on mine? And so, I mean, so an, an advantage would be, for example, you know, WordPress uh, allows you to use your own domain. So it could be, you know, blog.grc.com or, or steve.grc.com if I wanted a corporate and a personal blog. Of course. Um, and then just slash and some number, which well, would be... this is a new trend, which is a kind of a white label URL shortening. There are good 
URL shortening libraries that you can use on uh, almost any platform now that will allow you to have. Well, GRC is pretty damn short. <laughs> I was going to say, and I've got my, all my own technology, yeah. so I don't need any help with it'd be, that. It'd be an easy thing to make that be your short. Instead of bit.ly, grc.com is one letter longer. Yep. And I think then we'd know where we're going. I think that's a great idea. It is, It is frankly, the biggest, and Twitter created this problem. It's the biggest problem that Twitter created, which is the need for shortened URLs. Mm -hmm. it, you know, tiny URL predates Twitter, but Twitter made it much more popular. Well, and, and Leo, I'm getting spam. Oh, it breaks so, the web. It breaks the web. The web is not designed for, for obfuscated URLs. It's a bad yes. thing. And, and so when, when I'm getting like really attractive looking women who are talking to me, I'm thinking, yeah, okay, wait a minute. Yeah. There's something fishy about this. <laughs> we don't get and, that know, very often. <laughs> and, then, and then she's sending me a link mm -hmm. to, to something. It's like, oh, wait a minute. You know, that's not what I want to click on because we know that, I mean, it's exactly equivalent to clicking on a link in email. It's fishing. It's going to. It's going to open my browser to a, to a destination exactly. I don't I can't even see I don't I don't know about and that can be all it takes these days to take my machine over. That's why you want to only follow trusted people. Yep. And even then, because unfortunately Twitter's security sucks, mm -hmm. people have been hacked many times. Yeah. And uh, not th not necessarily through any fault of their own. So even then, with you know, if it's a suspicious message, you may want to be careful about what you're clicking on. Yeah, it you know it's a bad model. There are a number of uh, third-party utilities uh, or third-party Twitter tools that will sh will show you what the obfuscated URL, the Bitly URL, is on your full, way there. On your way there, and I think those are I prefer those. A good one that I use if you want to use a web interface is Brizzly, B R I Z Z L Y, dot com. It's it's a web interface to Twitter. Instead of using Twitter's page, you use Brizzly. Right. They do things like expand pictures so you don't have to click the link to see what the picture is. And they unobfuscate uh, bit.ly okay. URLs. There's a cool. lot of ways to do that. Jeez. Cool. Now there's a lot of people listening going, why did Steve start to Twitter? <laughs> oh, God. Now we got to hear about Twitter and iPad. Uh, it'll be a good thing. No. And you know uh, what? I'm glad you are because uh, there are security issues with Twitter. And I think it's a valuable thing for you to be um, casting your beady eyes on what's going on there. Yep. Be aware of what's happening. You know, recently I've deleted my Facebook account because of the issues with Facebook. It's really serious concern to me. Yeah. And not so much because I, you know, I live in public. So, and I know enough to only post stuff on Facebook that, I, that potentially everybody will see. I don't put anything personal or private on Facebook. But it's coercive to use Facebook because anybody who wants to interact with me on Facebook has to join. So by participating in the Facebook ecosystem, oh, I'm yeah. promoting a what I know to be an unsafe privacy uh, concern. So I've decided to completely opt out of the Facebook uh, ecosystem. I, you know, it, it in a way that hurts us because we use Facebook to promote Twit, right? But I feel uncomfortable coercing my users into using Facebook to follow me. I, I should say one of the things I appreciate about Twitter, and for those. Listeners, I mean, I know there's tens of thousands of listeners who are probably where I was a week ago. If anyone's curious to see what I've been tweeting, you, you just say twitter.com slash agile synapse. You don't have to join. Right. And there's there from uh, sorted from most recent to least recent is the history of my tweets. Precisely. God, strange vocabulary over the over the last <laughs> You'll get used to it. Over the last week. So anyone's curious, twitter.com slash agile synapse, and you can see what I've been tweeting. By the way, here's the uh, Brizzly interface to Twitter. Very similar, but you see all of your bitlies have been expanded. So now instead of saying bitly, it says use it.com. And so I know exactly where I'm going, which is really, I, really a good thing. It also wait, has that, a, a few things that are handy for Twitter users. For instance, it explains what the trends are. So if you see Theresa May as a trend on Twitter, you can see why Theresa May is a trend on Twitter. Uh, and that's, that's helpful. It's a, I, you know, it's a, it's a web-based interface. And if you have multiple accounts, as you do, it allows you to maintain both accounts on a single page. I, so that's, that's just my little plug for, uh, for them. But I would, I'm glad you're looking into security on Twitter. Keep, <laughs> keep doing that. Will do. <laughs> Anything else you want to talk about before we get to the portable dog killer? Ready when you are. All right. Well, let's uh, let's pause and talk about Astaro briefly. Astaro's been oh, with yay. us since the very... Yeah, I know. I love them. They've been with us since the very beginning. They were our first sponsor on the Twit Network. 
We love them. We're very happy to be part of them. And I know when uh, Steve goes to conferences like RSA, there's a star and we say hi. A star, what is it? Well, it's a, a security uh, gateway, essentially. Software and hardware to protect your business. Sometimes they call them UTMs, Unified Threat Management Devices. It's more than a firewall. It looks like a firewall. In fact, it looks like a router, except that it's made out of like heavy-gauge steel. It's tough. But the Astara Security Gateway does so much more. Of course, state-of-the-art firewall, constantly updated, by the way, automatically by the Astaro Up-to-Date feature. So, you know, it's, it's, it's always up-to-date with the latest, greatest, stateful packet inspection, all the things you expect from a firewall, but then you get more, much more. Three kinds of antivirus, two for the web, one for email, automatically filtering everything that comes into your enterprise. So you don't have to train your, well, it's probably a good idea, but you don't have to train your users not to click on the you know, email uh, attachments, things like that, because it's already protected. Uh, there's also some convenience features. So there's a security features, and there's things like content filtering. You can block or control IM and peer-to-peer -peer and all of the stuff that you need to do in a business. But there's also some convenience features, like a complete VPN, including SSL. So it uses all the traditional VPN technologies, IPsec, L2TP over IPsec, PPTP tunneling with SSL, which makes it very easy for the boss. He doesn't have, you know, it just, a browser just works. It's amazing. How do you know that, Smithers? Uh, I love this, too, because uh, I'm a big fan, and I'm a big believer, and I wish more people would do uh, email signing. Uh, it makes this completely automatic and transparent using either OpenPGP or SMIME. Your choice. Automatic email signing, automatic email verification, automatic email encryption and decryption, should you choose. Just it happens in the UTM. Also, really, it grows with your enterprise. They have for large uh, multi-user enterprise environments. They have a something they call active-active clustering that enables the load distribution for as many as ten gateways. So you don't have to add additional load balancing. It just does it. Home users, good news for you. In fact, if you're an IT professional, of course you can get a demo unit in your office for free. Just call eight seven seven the number four, A S T A R O. But if you are a um, uh, non-commercial user, you can just try it for free. You can download it from staro.com slash security now, or there's a VMware appliance. It's one of the most popular VMware appliances. You can run it on any beige box, and they are now including the Astaro up-to-date in there, the subscription free. is a great company. A-S-T-A-R-O.com if you want to know more. For a free demo unit, if you're in the U.S., call 877, the number 4, A-S-T-A-R-O. They operate all around the world. If you're outside the U.S., just visit staro.com for the local Astaro rep, and uh, they'll get you a unit in your business. Astaro Security Gateway. It's the best. We thank them so much for years of support with the security now. Okay, I'm ready for the story of the dog that <laughs> ate the laser or whatever that is. <laughs> okay, well, so it's 1971, and I'm 16 years old, a sophomore in high school. And we had a real problem with a dog in the neighborhood. Um, I don't know if this dog was clinically rabid or what its problem was, but it was about two blocks away from where I lived. And the, the people who owned this dog had sort of a, um, an RV trailer or something parked in the backyard and, and a fence which went right up to the sidewalk, which contained not only this RV, but this unbelievably vicious dog. And the, the, so the, fen the, the, the fence had a gate where sort of this driveway was um, right onto the road, but this was not like their main uh, garage entrance. And the, the fence, the, the, the two wings of this gate were pinned just at the bottom so that it was sort of, it's sort of, sort of flapping open if there was any pressure on it. So what would happen was for, I don't even know how long this was going on, but I mean, it, it was a serious problem. People walking by the sidewalk would virtually be attacked by this amazingly vicious dog. Um, I, I'm a dog person. I grew up with dogs. Um, I, I love dogs. Uh, you know, I, I actually, at, at the time of this going on, I had a co red cocker, uh, redhead cocker spaniel. 
And um, so, so this this dog was just unbelievable. It would it would scare the bejesus out of people because they'd be walking on the sidewalk and this thing would hear them and come galloping through the backyard and lunge at the top of this gate, which looked like it was about to spring open. And I mean, and the dog, I think it was a German shepherd. I can't quite remember the breed now, but I mean, it was big. And I mean, the, the owner's I don't know what could have been in their mind. They must have known this was a problem. They must have been getting complaints from people. But, you know, times were different then. You know, dogs were not on leashes. Kids were not on leashes. I mean, you know, dogs roamed the streets. Um, it, you know, times were, as I said, this was 39 years ago. But finally one day, as I was coming around my block, there was this elderly lady, and I, I, th th this all happened in San Mateo up in Northern California, which is where I was in junior high and high school, and this dog scared the this elderly lady so much that she tripped and fell off the sidewalk into the street. I mean, it was that big a problem. It was just unbelievable. And so I thought, okay, I need to take matters into my own hands. This dog needs some training. That it is not okay to to rush people and lunge at the gate and look like it's about to jump over the gate and the gate looks itself like it's about to give way because it was only pinned at the bottom and wasn't closed at the top. So I thought in order to train this this aberrant canine, um, I need to do something that will shock it, something give it an experience that is negative which is completely outside of its normal, you know, daily experience. So I thought I need a, some sort of a sonic, loud sonic weapon. So. <laughs> oh, Steve. <laughs> I can see where this is going. <laughs> oh, this actually, this has unforeseen consequences, which is part of the moral of this, of this story. The case of the aberrant canine. So. Um, my parents were um, divorced at the time, and my father and his wife living up in, 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 in the city in San Francisco. So my sister and I would jump on the train uh, Friday afternoons and take it up to San Francisco, and then the trolleys over to the marina on the other side of the city where, where, where dad and his wife were. And then Saturday mornings was sort of free-for-all time. Basically, it was kids, get out of the house, go play um, you know, I mean, as I said, times were different 40 years ago. And one of my favorite areas in the city was Mission Street. It was a couple blocks out of the city from Market. That's one of the main, you know, like Market Street's the main drag. And back then, Mission Street was lined with war surplus stores. And of course, I think it I'd, still is, actually. Is it still? Yeah, I, I think there's a bunch of army surplus stores down there. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, I was, I was hacking when I was five. In fact, you know, on my resume page, there's a picture of me that dad took before I was five years old in the backyard building something with, you know, wiring circuits and things. I mean, I just had this drive yeah. from forever. So for me, I would just, I could spend hours in these war surplus stores. I mean, you know, at, you know, ra radar sets, you know, dynamometers, all just, it was like nirvana for me. But this particular weekend, I was on a mission because I, I had to build some sort of a sonic beam weapon in order to deal with this dog. <laughs> so... <laughs> Was there no parental supervision at all? Not at all. None no, at they'd all. they'd given up. Yeah, <laughs> I'd, I'd beat them to beat them senseless. No, they knew Steve. I. They knew I was a good kid. They yeah. knew I was not gonna, you no. know, get them into any real trouble. Right. I mean, you know, the Boy Scouts of America might disagree with that, but that's a story for a different time. <laughs> um, I mean, most parents, if they heard the phrase "sonic weapon." <laughs> Military surplus store and dog might exhibit some concern. Yeah, mom. Mom just no. said, "Okay, you know, Whatever, I don't Steve. know what you're doing. Just you know, <laughs> don't kill yourself." So, um, so I found the pieces I needed. I don't know if it was over one week or several visits, but I found this amazing, uh, like 
grip from like maybe a helicopter trigger handle or something. But I mean, it was a it was a gun grip with a switch in it, which is like, okay, perfect. And I needed a transducer, some sort of a high frequency, high power transducer and rummaging around in these bins with my sister sort of in tow. She's two years younger than me. So she was 14 and just sort of, you know, following big brother around. I found a, some sort of a piezo, it was in like a black steel casing, a piezoelectric crystal with this, with a pointed silver dome. And I said, oh, that looks like the right kind of thing. So, you know, none of this cost anything. It was 50 cents for this, two bucks for something else. And so, so I got those things. I also found a, just a perfect photo flash parabolic reflector that who's at, at the widest part, it was probably about maybe 10 inches um, in diameter. It's so very thought, Tom okay. Swift here. Oh, this, I mean, this, this is what happened. And so what I, then I needed a body for it. And in San Mateo, down on 42nd Avenue was like a real electronic store, not like a radio shack that was just kind of cheesy. This was 42nd Avenue electronics. And so I found a, a steel little mini box to, I think it was like two inches by two inches by six to be the body of the gun. And, and then set about building this sonic weapon. There was a, a chip at the time that called the 555, the NE 555. I think Signetics in, uh, in, innovated this thing. It was this incredibly so, versatile oscillator. What year was this? 1971. So, oh, this, this is very early in yeah. terms of microprocessors. Yeah. Oh, we didn't have those. No. No, no, no. I mean, and my first job was, it might have been this same year uh, or the year after, uh, with this is where I encountered the PDP-8 for the uh -huh. first time. Uh -huh. So, so I built an oscillator, and uh, and I, I I wanted the frequency to be. I mean, I understood that dogs have very sensitive hearing, and they're able to hear outside of the range that we can. You know, like, like the classic dog whistle, where you, you you know we blow it, and the dogs perk up. We sort of hear maybe like like you know, air blowing, or maybe we can get a sense of something. But mm. on the other hand, I didn't want it to be supersonic because I wanted to know if it was working. So I wanted to be able to hear it too. So I pitched it somewhere like around 15 kilohertz as my guess, way high, but still audible to us. And I had a, a um, I remember that I had power settings. Remember that at this time, you know, Star Trek was happening. And so, of course, they had phasers. And so I was you know, obviously modeling this on something sort of that I'd seen in, you know, in science fiction. So I had, I remember a knob on the back with, it had four positions um, off just so, you know, you wouldn't hit the trigger by mistake. And then three power settings. What I, and I had three different colored dots that I got the stationary store, a green dot, a yellow dot, and a red dot. And this thing had three 9-volt transistor radio batteries in it. So the green dot gave it 9 volts on, on the output stage. The yellow dot was 18 volts, and the red dot was 27 volts. All three batteries ganged in series. And so I assembled the oscillator, built the output, the power amplifier stage that was transformer coupled to this um, piezoelectric uh, uh, transducer. And, and it worked. Then I built this thing together, you know, mounted the, the pistol grip on the bottom of the box, the, this perfect photo flash parabolic mirror on the front, and then positioned the um, transducer in the focus of the parabolic mirror so that it would, it would work. And the, the machine was finished. Now, back then I was 16. I called this the portable dog killer. <laughs> Not worried too much about SEO, I guess. Well, exactly. <laughs> or police. <laughs> um, and, and, I mean, or the again, ASPCA. I'm, I'm, uh, it wasn't that I wanted to kill this dog. Certainly not. Um, but the dog would have killed anybody who walking by if it could get loose. I mean, this thing was out of control. So the name was more inspired by the fact that the dog was the killer than, than that this was going to do any killing. I just wanted to teach the pooch that it's not safe any longer to go lunging at passersby. I mean, literally, I mean, the, the, the fence was at the edge of the sidewalk. And I mean, this, this was a hazard to, to, to public health. And, fa and frankly, I was probably saving the dog's life, or I hoped to, 
by training it not to do this. Because sooner or later, something horrible was going to happen, and the dog would be put down. So, I mean, it, it would just, it would, that dog would be destroyed. So, um, this thing, oh my God, it really worked. Two things I remember about it vividly is I was surprised by how quiet it was off axis. That is, it really did, this parabolic mirror really did focus the beam of sound that it produced um, so that it, you know, it wasn't, it didn't hurt you at all to like be behind it mm -hmm. to be the shooter or even to the side. But boy, <laughs> when you aim this at yourself, it was, it made the weirdest <laughs> sensation. There was, I think it was You probably, felt it. You didn't hear it, but you felt it. Well, there was like this, yes. No, no, you also heard it. I mean, it was no. pitched down low enough that it was, I mean, it was really loud. But something about the phasing of it with your ears, it made this weird sort of like bone crunching <laughs> feeling in the middle of your head. Oh, dear. It was just strange. Anyway, I thought, well, this ought to do the trick. <laughs> so... I, you know, snuck up to the gate the first time and did, you know, here, doggy, <laughs> or something to the effect. And I heard, grum, 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 rah, and as, as it always did. And I blasted it in the face, point blank. Ooh. Now, the dog made Now, it's sound. not lethal. We should emphasize. It's not lethal. No, and the dog was never hurt. Nothing. I mean, it wouldn't hurt ants. It might make them go around in circles, but right. it wouldn't, wouldn't right. hurt them. The dog's... Legs collapsed. I mean, they fell out, it, you know, fell to the ground and then, and then ran as fast as it possibly could away. So, so I thought, okay, round one. And an hour later, I came back and like, you know, nudged the fence a little bit. And I heard, grum, 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 rah, and I <laughs> blasted it again. And this went on for a couple oh, hours. Oh, jeez. And then I remember... We are not like, recommending this. And we will not... This may not be your first blog post is the plans for this device. No. So... <laughs> I don't want the ASPCA calling me. Well, like I said, this ended up working out well for the dog. I really believe... Oh, no. Oh, no. Because a few hours later, I, I went up to the fence and the dog didn't attack. And I will never forget carefully, because, I mean, this thing was really... This would have taken your head off peeking over the fence and there was the dog i could i could see its nose and one eye peering fearfully around the, the, the corner of the house there's something over there i don't know so, what it is <laughs> <laughs> so so i was delighted with this and it, i think it took about 3 days before the first shot of the day wouldn't, you know, like the dog was realizing, okay, this is just not something I'm going to be able to continue doing. This has been its its favorite thing, attacking people for who knows, I mean, for months or years. I mean, it was sort of a known problem in the neighborhood. And it was finally when, he, when I saw a block away, this poor elderly lady literally blown off the sidewalk. Oh, I said, okay, yeah. this is not okay. Yeah. So, so that was done. Now, my buddies at school had sort of been aware of the project. I was telling them what I was doing. Steve, you must have been such a cool kid. I am so, so this is so cool. So they wanted to see this. Sure they did. <laughs> so it was, I figured, okay, it's show and tell day. So I brought the portable dog killer to high school. Um, before first period, the gang had gotten together. I would, we had what we called the MRC gang, which was the Math Resource Center. In other words, this is Nerds. the geek. This is the Jeez. nerd, the nerd group of the high school, a math resource center group. Oh boy. And uh, I don't remember which one of us it was, but um, we had a real problem in the school. And I, I need to explain a little bit about the structure of the school, the layout, because this comes into play here in a little bit. Um, Aragon High School in San Mateo was in the form of it like a huge square donut. Um, so it was hollow in the middle and there was an Olympic sized swimming pool and some other concrete sort of on a lower level and then sloping up from the lower level up to the normal class level was this huge green lawn with some trees. And, you know, we called it the quad because it was a quadrangle and, and then in the inner perimeter 
was sort of sidewalk and against the wall were all of the student lockers. So it was this, you know, large square structure. One single structure was the entire high school with then classes all around the outer perimeter um, and sort of going down in, in spoked halls from this center quad. Well, um, I, we had a problem with seagulls. Um, you know, we're not far from the ocean. I don't really know where the seagulls came from, but you know, they were constantly circling around and, you know, no doubt looking for, law, for, for, you know, potato chips or unguarded sandwiches or, you know, scraps of food that students would, would leave behind. And, of course, unfortunately, they create a big mess just with their own droppings. Someone, and I don't remember now who, uh -uh. <laughs> shot a seagull with the portable dog killer. I want to under emphasize at this point, for those just tuning in, the name dog killer is... Euphemistic. Euf um, it doesn't kill. It's a sonic blast that is harmless. Yes. It's but annoying. Yes. It, well, what it did was it nearly knocked the seagulls out of the sky. <laughs> now, we're, thir we're, we're 16 oh years old. Oh, dear. Pong won't be invented for another year. Oh, no. Until 1972. Oh, no. We had no video games. Until now, we didn't have any kind of a beam weapon. We saw it on Star Trek, of course. Now we had one, and it shot birds. Now, it didn't kill them, but it definitely, it definitely surprised them. <laughs> and this was the best thing that had ever happened to us. Because it was like, you know, something was reacting to this. Sure. It was fantastic. The non-lethal bird stunner. Yes, it was fantastic. And so, Aragon High School was the, uh, do, performing an experiment in the district. This was the second year of what was called flexible scheduling. More like college scheduling. Instead right. of all students being in classes, periods one through seven, we had blocks of free time scattered throughout the day. Sa different yes. times and different days of the week. Santa Cruz High did that too when I was okay. there at the same time. Yep. And um, so Very what trendy. happened... What ha yeah, very trendy, and we loved it. Um, what happened was that meant that various of us in the gang had free time in different slots. So then it became a matter <laughs> of handing the gun oh, from, from one to the other. And basically, we would, in small groups that were free during that period, lay on the grass for having target practice. Oh, man. You know, shooting seagulls. Which was just fantastic. You know, I mean, they, they, each, each seagull reacted a little differently, but there was definitely a reaction. I mean, you knew when you got a shot off. And uh, so that's the way we spent the day. It was just, you know, it, we were having the time of our life. So at this time, I was, um, I was creating curriculum for the third year of electronics. Um, the high school had electronics one and two, which was the first two semesters of the first year, which taught basic electrical theory using tubes, unfortunately. And the, the, the professor, uh, Harold Farron, uh, was a neat guy, old, gnarly, ex-Navy guy. And tubes was what he knew. For him, transistors was a big deal. He wasn't quite sure about them. That was electronics three and four in the second year of electronics. And, of course, this was, I felt like I died and gone to heaven to actually be in school taking electronics. I mean, here, I, I, mean, I already knew electronics. I force-fed myself Apparently, this Apparently, yeah. Um, you know, years before. But now I was actually getting credit for it and, <laughs> and had a lot of enthusiasm for it. And at one point, I said to him, I guess in, our, in my second year, as a, that, I mean, that year, my sophomore year, I said, Mr. Farron, why, you know, what about digital electronics? Why, why you know, it's nice that... We learned about tubes last year, and transistors are good, but the future is digital. And he said, well, I don't know digital. Mm. And I said, well, it's really not that hard. And he said, well, why don't you teach it? <gasps> wow. And so during, the, during my sophomore year, I created an entire curriculum for third-year electronics, which we created there, and I heard 
years later that it had, it had gone district wide and was being taught throughout the whole oh, San Mateo neat. Union High School that's District. That's so neat. So the point of this is that after school, I would go into the electronics lab and work on this stuff. And I had free reign. I'd, I'd come to the attention of the administration very early on. I think it might have been the incident with the shock machine. I'm not quite sure what <laughs> the, the first shock machine. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's yeah, another, another story. story. <laughs> but, um, so, but, you know, Mr. Farron knew that he could trust me. And he would leave and leave the doors locked. And I just, my, my wow. re requirement was just, oh, yeah, I mean, I was trusted um, just to you know, make sure that I'd pull the door behind me. So the this afternoon of the of the the sonic beam weapon, uh, I was probably leaving around four thirty, and so the school was completely deserted. Nobody there. I mean, literally, I it's completely empty. The whole quad was empty. I went to my locker, got the books that I needed, got the the portable dog killer out of the locker, which where I had stowed it at the end of seventh period, and. To this day, I don't know what I was thinking. Oh, no. <laughs> because I saw on the far other side of the quad, yeah. Mr. Archibald, mm. the assistant principal. Mm -hmm. And so... No! There was good no. cover where I was. <laughs> no! We had these big concrete no. containers for the garbage and big cement planters. And so I crouched down behind one of these garbage, cement garbage can containers and shot Mr. Archibald oh, dear. with the portable dog killer. Oh, dear. Now, I mean, it was a long way away. He was. And I was hidden. Um, what completely jarred me was his reaction. You would think that, you know, a regular person being shot at great distance by a sonic beam weapon would be a little confused. They'd look around, kind of like look up maybe. It's like, what is going on? Not Mr. Archibald. Gibson! He, he, no, he couldn't see me. So, I mean, I was hidden. I, I was yeah. undercover. Yeah. He spun <laughs> around. <laughs> And that's what took my breath away. It's like, oh, my God. I just, I didn't expect a reaction like that at all. <laughs> and, and he stood there motionless, oh. trying to take in the entire scape of this, this huge high school quad. Um, and he just, he was motionless. And he was looking for, for like anything. And so I'm thinking, oh, my God. So, you know, I... I was, I'm probably starting to shake at this point, but I kept my cover and, and he stood there slowly looking from side to side. And then, you know, I, you know, he appeared to give up and he turned back around and continued walking in the direction he had been before. Now and I've thought, gotten word that a child is using his imagination and I've come to put a stop to it. <laughs> Principal Skinner <laughs> on his way. So I stood up and started to get the heck out of <laughs> the quad. He, but I kept one eye on him, of course, because the, he was the danger. Oh, yeah. Well, he faked me out. Oh. He spun around again and saw me and pointed at I me. I saw that. <laughs> pointed at me and then beckoned with his other oh. hand. Oh, dear. So he's smart. How do you know? Oh, this is, well, you know. I guess you he, were well he, known by now. He, well, yeah, yeah, I was. <laughs> and so we met about halfway in front of the office wing. And he, and I, I was doing everything I could with my body language to have this gun be as inconspicuous as possible. <laughs> what did it, it, it had this parabolic thing. Oh, it wasn't inconspicuous at all. Yeah. I mean, it was clearly <laughs> like a gun. A, a ray gun. You know, I mean, I, it was a ray gun. So that's the way I, I. That's the way I designed it, you know, with a power control oh, knob on the back with, you know, green, yellow, and red and oh. a big reflector out the front. So, so it was dangling at my side as sort of as inconspicuously as possible. So we approached and he looked at me and he said, Stephen, mm. and I said, hello, Mr. Archibald. And he, and he looks down 
at it and then back at me and said, what is that? Oh, boy. And I said, um, <laughs> well, it's a, it's a sonic beam gun. <laughs> I wasn't going to use its real name. <laughs> and he said, I see. I see. And did you just shoot me with it? <laughs> and I said, uh, yes, sir, I did. <laughs> Well, you're very honest, Steve. That's good. Oh yeah, I'm. You know, and I mean, what? Well, yeah, <laughs> there wasn't much. There wasn't much choice of answer. No, I mean, no, I didn't shoot you, no, sir, no. Uh, uh. <laughs> At this point. And so he said, "And where did you get that?" Mm. And I said, "I, I built mm. it." Alien he said, "You designed it." Wow. I said, "Yes." And he said, <laughs> "Why?" <laughs> So I gave an abbreviated version of the, the dog story about uh, training this dog yeah. to not attack people any longer that were walking by on the sidewalk. And he said, and was that successful? I said, it was. <laughs> and he said, and you brought it to school this morning. Mm. I said, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And he said, and were you shooting it all day long? Mm. And I said, um, well, it turns out that it, uh, it also shoots seagulls and it pretty much knocks them out of the sky. And he said, I see. And so I said, you know, my, my friends and I, he said, the MRC gang. I said, mm. oh, you know about that? Mm. He says, I know everything. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, yeah, we were sort of handing it you know, around during our various free periods for target practice. And he said, I, 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 oh, and, and I said, I, you know, I didn't seem to be a problem. He said, oh, we'll be talking about problems in a minute. And he said, um, we began getting phone calls <gasps> in the morning. Oh, dear. From teachers all over the school. Oh, dear. Who were reporting high frequency sounds? <laughs> they didn't know what was wrong. They thought maybe the heater system had gone on, on the blink. And I said, "Oh." Ooh. And he and he said, <clears throat> "So we called the district engineers. Oh boy, and uh, and they came out and they heard these sounds too. We heard sure. them in the office wing as well. Everyone was hearing them." And they thought maybe it was the ultrasonic alarm system that protects the school had gone on the fritz. And, of course, we couldn't, we couldn't close down the school with an alarm system that wasn't functional because there'd be all kinds of consequences for that. So they worked on the alarm system trying to figure out if it had gone wonky somehow. Mm -hmm. So... <sighs> Now we know what it was. Yeah. It was you, you and your sonic beam <laughs> weapon. He said, I guess I'm glad you shot me because the mystery is solved. <laughs> he said, now, I want you to take that home. Oh. And I don't want to ever see it or hear it again. I'm amazed he did not confiscate it. He did not. Well, he knew me. I mean, yeah. you know, I was. You were a I good was, kid. I was a good kid. I'm sure that, you know, I'd, I'd, I'm sure that the office knew I had permission even to stay in the right. electronics lab after hours right. and, and all that. Because, I mean, Farron was very much by the book, being ex-Navy. He was not liked by m most students who thought he was way too rigid. Right. I just thought he was great. So um, I took the gun home, put it on the shelf. Um, my friends and I were all very disappointed. They were sure. all anticipating many more days of target practice. Although, to be fair, I have to say that by the end of the day, there really weren't so many seagulls any longer circling around overhead. Mm. Train and, them uh, too, I guess. Well, I, I think they decided <laughs> this is not where we want to be. No. So that's the story of the portable dog killer. Steve, what a great story. And the... When I was thinking about this, I was thinking about all the email that that I've received during the podcast from young listeners mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. wonder 
you know, how to get going, how to get started, what, you know, what would I recommend? How do they differentiate themselves? And the second employee at Gibson Research Corporation, uh, the, one of the most brilliant engineer programmers I've ever known, a guy named Steve Rank, um, went on to found a couple gaming companies. He has one now called Specular mm. Entertainment. His first one was, was uh, Swing and Apes, which he sold to Blizzard. Oh. Um, and what, what stood out in my mind about Steve actually is w w really that, like me, he was building things from the beginning. Nothing could stop him from building things. He was, you know, involved. He, you know, I mean, I heard about all the projects that he had built, much as I had as a kid. It's a good sign, and, isn't it? Well, that's my point, yes, is clearly there were incredible unintended consequences from my creating this this gun to train this incredibly vicious, ferocious dog. Um, but that's what happens when you build things. Um, nothing happens if you're sitting behind a screen shooting aliens in a video game. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, doesn't happen. All the discoveries that have been made have been made by people experimenting. Do something. You know, yeah. you know Tesla was building all kinds of things. And it's, you, you, you can't know what you're going to learn until it, you're confronted by it. You've got problems. You've, something happens you don't expect. I mean, it's just, it's amazing how opportunity rich the environment is. But if you're not in it, you're not going to get the opportunity. And so what I would encourage people to do, I mean, I, I, you know, Steve and I are still good friends. and We get together every so often and we, we sort of reminisce about the projects that we built and, and think to each other, can you imagine being a 10-year-old now oh, what opportunities. with all the stuff yeah. there is. I mean, there's these things, programmable gate arrays, um, which are just amazingly powerful, where you can use software to program logic in, like, softly in this. I mean, there, I, I don't know what I would... I mean, there just isn't enough hours in the day as it is for me. But if I were a 10-year-old or 12-year-old or 15-year-old... You know, I would say, turn off the video game. That's doing nothing. Build something. Build anything. Um, I mean, the 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 feedback you get, the 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 fun, but mostly the discovery. You will end up discovering things that you know you cannot predict. You cannot know about. That's the nature of it. But um, I, you know, I just think that's that's something that that our pasteurized world has sort of lost a little bit of. I mean, this sounds like a wild story. I guess it was probably a little wild in 1971, but probably not as wild as it, it sounds today. Today, uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security would be coming to your door. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, But anyway, it's a very good, you know, I even have in a very small way a similar uh, story. And it did start for me with video games. I got an Atari 2600, but... What the game did is made me think, oh, I want to know how this works. And uh, soft, it doesn't have to be a physical thing you're building. It's easy to build software. Oh, yes. In fact, that's where I've switched to. Yeah. It, it, yes. And everybody has an opportunity now for free. There's so many great choices. There's Alice.org, a great way to start littler kids on, uh, on object-oriented programming. And there's so many things out there. Just, yeah, I think, but I think there has to be that little seed in your brain, which you obviously have, Steve obviously has, where you get inspired to say, I want to make something. So I, I, and I think there will always be people doing that. I think it's a, a it's, it's a, maybe it's a matter of empowerment. I mean, now I will say that my dad did encourage me. I mean, one of the things that I did when I was five, we would go down to the, to the docks in Oakland and buy a hunk of electronic gear coming off of the the um, you know naval ships down there, and we you know they they hung it on a fish hook, a big huge fish hook, and you paid for it by the pound. And the car looked like a you know like its suspension had gone broke in the back because this thing was in the trunk. And we'd bring it home, and he'd sit it in the middle of the garage, and he'd say, "Okay, go at it." 
I mean, there was nothing I wanted to That's do great. more than yeah. tear that thing apart. And he, and he says that he knew that, you know, I was internalizing the work right. of the country's best engineers as I was taking this apart. And he thought that someday I would start putting things back together again. And, you know, it turned out that was sort of the path I took. But um, so there, there has to be, I think, some encouragement. Um, but, but as you said, also some spark. And, you know, yeah. nothing, nothing could stop me from, from this kind of inquiry. And so I would just encourage, encourage people to, to get involved, to do something. I mean, something proactive, something creative, not just passive. Because passive, nothing's going to happen that way. I think that it's probably the case that there are people who just don't have that spark and they're going to, you know, look, we need, we need people to flip burgers. Uh, and those people, you know, it, not everyone's going to be a maker, but boy, if you see that spark in a kid, just encourage it. Don't discourage yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a great lesson. And you know what? Thank goodness that vice principal Archibald, hmm. um, you know, he didn't beat you up over this. He knew, he sensed that this was something that was appropriate for you to do. He made sure well, you didn't and, and, do it at the school. <laughs> yes, and, and he understood. It was completely unforeseen. There was no way I could know. Right. Or that, oh, I forgot to tell you one thing. He said, as I was, as I was leaving with the, you know, with, with, with the gun and, and having, being, breathing a big sigh of relief, he said, oh, there's one thing, Steve. I said, yes, sir. He said, next time something appears to go wrong with the high school, we're going to track you down first. <laughs> We're calling you. <laughs> I think that's just, a. I think that's wise. Just because I mean, he went through so much trouble. Oh. I mean, you know, bringing people, engineers out from the district, crawling around to figure out what had gone wrong with the heaters, and yeah. then with the ultrasonic alarms. I mean, I don't want like to think about the expense that they went through, but he realized had they just said, Steve, are you doing anything strange today? <laughs> what are you up to there, Mr. Yeah. G? <laughs> oh. Uh, I think that's just a wonderful story, and uh, I I would have to ask. I don't suppose you still have the portable dog killer. I, I have a lot of my paraphernalia. I've got. I did do uh, helium neon laser guns later in life, and I have some of those. But um, I don't know what happened to this. Um, I you know I went to Berkeley and then moved to Southern California, and at one point there was. I actually had a lab upstairs in San Mateo. That's where this was built. Was in Steve's. You know, I'd be in the lab, as they put it. You know, when I was called for dinner, um, which is where I built this. So, um, and it was just sort of an extra room that I commandeered. I said, okay, this is mine. This is this is you know my space. I need a lab. <laughs> so, um, at one point there was a purging of all the stuff I'd left oh, behind. Yeah, of course. And I think that, yeah. that that happened. I mean, I can see it clearly in my mind, and of course. Many people were witness to all this craziness, but and I, my life was a series of wacky adventures like that. We'll uh, we'll share one every so often. I love that spirit, and you know they, they, they we celebrate that spirit today with the Maker, uh, Make Magazine, the Maker Fairs, and there is this notion about of making, which is focused, I think, on physical making, which is a great thing. But but it's it's fine to make with software. In fact, more than ever, we need software. Uh, and that's a perfectly appropriate, and I think kids it should cost learn. nothing. Cost costs nothing. nothing. It, uh, you don't get your hands dirty, and most of the time the principal doesn't confiscate well, your program. And frankly, when people have asked me, and I've said this before on this show, how do I learn this language? How do I learn this, or how do I learn that? My, my answer is solve a problem yeah. with it. Yes. That is, you just can't sit there. I mean, reading a book about a Abstract language is, is, not good. is dry. Yeah. yeah. So... Come up with something you want to do and make yourself do it in that language. I mean, and it, 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 there's no hurry. There's no deadline. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. Just start. And when you start, the rest will flow. Such a great moral. I hope, you know, anybody listening to this show is probably in that category of a maker and doer. And, uh, and I mean, you wouldn't be listening to this show if you didn't have that spark. But, but it's good for us to remember. Spread it around. Let others get involved. We're going to, uh, I want to um, uh, sponsor at my kid's high school a first team, the robotics competition this oh, fall. Because that's yep. an, an example of, it's an institute, you know, it's truth is it's better if the kid does, goes off and does it on his own and gets in trouble like you did. But failing that, at least if there's some sort of institutional uh, encouragement to do that and some opportunity to do that, that's a, that's a good, get you started. Well, and it does, frankly, it does fit today's world more than, than, than building, you know, sonic beam weapons. Yes. It's today's world. Yes. So, 
Great, great show. Thank you, Steve. I really appreciate it. Always a, a pleasure. And this was a good one. I know, I'm glad you took a little time. I don't know how much Twitter had to do with this, but I'm glad that uh, you were inspired. I look forward to the blog. I presume it'll be at your website, grc.com. Yep, it will be. I'll announce it on the show and certainly through uh, the followers who are following me on good, Twitter. Good. And I'll, I'll have it up here uh, probably by next week. And uh, again, it was the, I want to remind people, it was the 50th today, or well, not the day, this week, the 16th. It's the 50th anniversary of the invention of the laser. Isn't that and cool? And so you can see what the tie-in was. That's what sort of laser. got me thinking about the my own beam weapon and, uh, and the story that uh, it, it begat. Isn't that great? Steve, thank you so much. Go to grc.com for Steve's stuff, 16 kilobit versions of this show. For those of you who have limited bandwidth, we, Steve's great. He edits this down and makes it available to you. He also does transcriptions on his own out of his own pocket. We thank you for doing that, Steve. That's all at grc.com, including the show notes. And once you're there, you got to get SpinRight, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility. I mean, following in the spirit of the portable dog killer. This is the portable hard drive cluster mess up killer. Sort of. 64K. <laughs> we know what you meant. <laughs> also, great free stuff. Lots of it. Shields up and all his great programs. GRC, Gibson Research Corp. GRC.com. Follow Steve on Twitter. I have to add this now at Agile Synapse. And Gibson Research is the Twitter handle for the uh, corporate account. But uh, the fun stuff's at, at Agile Synapse. S Y N A P S E. Steve, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Leo. On Security Now. Security Now.